Shalom and welcome to People Who Make a Difference, our interview segment dedicated to sharing with you, our viewers, those who through their lives are influencing and even changing society for the better and in Israel and around the world. Our guest today, Dr. Zion Huri, certainly qualifies as he is the chairman of Save a Child's Heart Foundation located near Tel Aviv. Save a Child's Heart is one of the largest undertakings in the world providing urgently needed pediatric surgery and follow-up care for children from the third world and developing countries. All children, in fact, regardless of race, religion, sex, color, or financial consideration, receive the best possible care that modern medicine has to offer. The entire surgical intensive care and nursing team at the Wolfson Medical Center in Holon are working together and they are saving a child's life every 29 hours. Dr. Huri, we're very delighted to have you be with us today and congratulations on the amazing work that you're doing. Now our friendship goes back a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a great time for another meeting actually. But I first <laughs> want to thank you for the very nice introduction and uh, it's a great time for a renewed meeting because we are celebrating our 10th year of activity. Mazal Tov. Thank you very much and we are very happy to still be around because it's not obvious to us. We have to constantly find uh, ways of continuing this uh, activity. Because you're sponsored by donors, right? We're sponsored only by donors. We had a great surprise last year. We are sponsored by the European Union Wonderful. to treat 100 uh, Palestinian children. Wonderful. And that was great news, yes. But generally speaking, I mean, things are just going in the right direction. We are approaching our 1,300 kids with heart surgery since we started. It's really amazing. The, our educational programs are growing. Right now we have uh, physicians from Bethlehem doing training in pediatric cardiology with us. She finished one year. She has two more to go. Now for our viewers, that means someone from the Palestinian Authority, right? From it's, Bethlehem. Oh, oh yeah, I mean, yes. yeah. Dr. Awad is a pediatrician, a Palestinian pediatrician who has interest in cardiology. Working together with Israeli oh, doctors. Yeah. We've been it's working amazing. constantly together. I mean, from here, I'm going to have dinner with the Palestinian friends, Dr. Neshashibi, I hope, and the Italian friends, Dr. Giancarlo. We've been working together. The idea is really to try to help the Palestinians go the same way we did here in Israel. You know, some 15 years ago, I've seen Israeli children die with congenital heart disease because there was nobody here to treat them. Today in Israel, not only can we treat our own children, but we can treat other people's children as well. So if we've done it, other people can do it. So this is what we're trying to help them to do. So you're going to mentor them to have a duplication of, of what, what you're doing do. only in the Palestinian Authority. That's wonderful. Exactly. The idea is to bring more and more physicians and nurses for training, but not only within the Palestinian Authority. Yesterday, we had a young uh, pediatrician from Addis Abeba, who arrived here to spend a year with us in the field of uh, pediatric intensive care. But one of the greatest news was, for example, the fact that till two years ago, for a population of 70 million in Ethiopia, they had only one pediatric cardiologist. Mm -hmm. To give you an idea, in Israel, for a population of less than 7 million, we have more than 30 of those. Right now, in Ethiopia, there are two pediatric cardiologists. The second one, Dr. Tseganet, trained with us and went back home to Ethiopia, two is a lot more than one, as you can imagine. So really the idea is the principle of capacity building, to help other people go the same way we did here in Israel. And while doing that, we have the pleasure of treating children from all over the world. Tell right. us about that. Like, from where do the kids come? I'll give you like a big uh, scoop for the TV. <laughs> we just a have, scoop, okay. Yeah. We would like a scoop for our viewers. Yes. We have, at the moment, seven Iraqi children here wow. in Israel. Now, as you know, uh, previous uh, relations with the Iraqis were Scud missiles flowing from Iraq to Israel. Right. But right now, it's children with congenital heart disease, and we like that much better, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we saw those kids uh, a, a month ago. We went to Amman. We saw those kids in Jordan. We evaluated them. Out of 25, Seven were already inoperable, which is a very sad thing, but the others are operable, and we are trying to make arrangements for three or four of them to be operated in Germany, two of them to be operated in India, 
and the others are going to be operated here in Israel. As I said, three of them have already been operated, and four more are waiting for operations, hopefully this week or next week. But we have all kinds of uh, crazy things happening, like, for example, after the tsunami, uh, a donor came in and said he would try, he'd like to do something for the people who suffered from the tsunami. So we got funding for 10 children from Sri Lanka. And right now, the papers at the Israeli embassy. Hopefully, they'll get the visa soon and arrive here. But our main idea is really to work with our partners like Ethiopia, Nigeria, Zanzibar, and mainly the Palestinians, both in the field of capacity building and treating the children in the mm -hmm. meantime. Well, our relationship goes back about 10 years now, eight years, when you approached us to help you make a promotional film of the work under uh, Dr. Ami Cohen. You were working with him, who of blessed memory, he's passed away now, and you've taken over from him. And then, so we made that film. That was sort of a beginning for you. And now, Mabatsheni, the big television network here, they've made you a couple of programs, and another man, Mr. Ehrlich. So you've had help in the media. But I'm also grateful to tell our viewers that our son, Chris, helped you design your website as well. Yep. And so Josh Rawlings and Chris Rawlings and now David Rawlings, we're all kind of, the Rawlings sons are really committed to our Save a Child's Heart project. And we want to continue on by helping you. And our viewers who are watching today, if you would like to help Dr. Huri uh, with his team save lives, save lives of Palestinian kids, Israeli kids, international children, poor kids, they can contact us, www.israelvision.com. We'll pass on your names to them and just say, save a child's heart. We want to help save kids' lives. And I'm, I'm hoping that many people around the world will, will respond to this. It's a tremendous public relations tool, although you didn't do it for that purpose. You're not in this business to make a PR for Israel, but isn't it amazing that Israelis are leading in the world in this way, kind of helping their neighbors? It's like what the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we call tikkun olam. We suppose Jewish people in Torah are supposed to do something for the world, but here we're not talking about talking of doing, we're actually doing it. Yes. That's much yes. simpler, much nicer, and I believe that goes straight to the hearts of people. I believe that at least 400 Palestinian families who know that we can definitively live together in peace. And I think that a lot of the Israeli people in the Israeli hospitals who saw those people got a different idea of what are the Palestinian neighbors. One of the things I love about this project is no matter how you look at it, you can only find good things. Mm -hmm. Now what about the kids from Gaza? Will they still be able to come and get help? Actually, you get, on TVs, you have a tendency to see the wrong things. But, you know, in the last, during all the Intifada years, and before that, and right now as well, we have a weekly free clinic, pediatric cardiology clinic, for Palestinian children. This week, for example, we had 10 children from the occupied territories, whether Gaza or Calcalia, who went into Volson to be seen free of charge by a cardiologist. A few of them are for follow-up, a few of them are new children with congenital heart disease. We, we've been working with the Palestinians during all the Intifada years, no matter what, was, what we had to see back home on the news in that evening, but we are still continuing with the project, no matter what was happening around us, like, you know, one of those trains does not look left or right, just mm -hmm. goes way right, because we know that we believe that you're doing the right thing. So politics stops at the door of the hospital, whether the kid's Palestinian, Chinese, Indian, whatever. He can get a heart, heart operation if he needs it. We believe that there no, should be no relation between medicine, between giving the best treatment to people, and politics. Those should be two absolutely different things. Dr. Huri, I know that your Save a Child's Heart project is always 
needing more funding. If you had more money, you could help more kids and train more doctors in other countries, in third world countries, to do the work you're doing. Now, it was encouraging to hear that the European Union has gotten behind you with Palestinian kids, but do you think that can grow, that relationship can grow in the future with them and with other countries? I definitely hope so, because, you know, the, we got a lot of money, we got half a million euros from the European Union. That's allowing us to take care of 100 Palestinian children. are going to have their life saved with this money, and the few Palestinian physicians are going to be trained by us with the same money. So this is really great for the Palestinian people, and I'm sure that you find other countries and the European Union as well will continue to help us in this direction to treat more children and educate more physicians. Excellent. But you know, I, I believe Ami died four years ago. Yes. He actually died in Africa, climbing yes. the Kilimanjaro. Yes. He died from high altitude sickness. You know, when you go to Zanzibar, you can actually see the Kilimanjaro top from the plane. And he told his daughter, next year we're going to come back and climb it. And he actually did it to the summit and died the first night coming down from the summit. Mm. And Hami's spirit was really, is definitely still alive with us. He's the one that give, give us hope that we'll find a way to continue. And so far, we've been able to do it. And I'm sure that you'll be able in the future as well. But it's really a constant struggle to find fundings to continue and try to enlarge those activities as much as we can. It's hard to believe that you have difficulty in finding funding for this very worthy project. But uh, I'm going to ask our viewing audience if they would please pray. Many of the people that watch our program are committed believers in the God of Israel, in, in, in their, his, their Messiah, Yeshua, and they believe that their prayers will be answered. So I'm going to give you a challenge there today. Pray for Save a Child's Heart Project, that they will get the funding they need to keep on saving the lives of kids. Dr. Hurry, thank you so much for being with us. And our prayer is that you will really prosper in these years and years and years ahead. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you much. for your wonderful work. Thank you. Not only to you. It's a family business here. So thanks, <laughs> thanks for the family. It's for a family. family. And you're part of that family. Shalom from Jerusalem. Hello, this is Dr. Jay Rawlings reporting to you for Fact or Fantasy. In this week's program, I want to address the myth that Israel's Supreme Court ruled that the security fence is illegal and a land grab by the Sharon government. The fact of the matter is that in 1989, Alan Dershowitz, the famed lawyer, observed that for the first time in the Middle East history, there is an independent judiciary willing to listen to the grievances of Arabs. That judiciary is called the Israeli Supreme Court." End of quote. That court took up the grievances of the Palestinians who claimed that the Israeli security fence causes hardships for them, is illegal under Israeli and international law, and is meant to disguise the Israeli objective of annexing additional territory. The court, however, ruled that a small segment of the fence an 18-mile stretch near Jerusalem, out of the 125 miles built at the time, needed to be rerouted due to the hardships that it caused the Palestinians in the area, who were cut off from their farms, schools, and villages. The court also said that it could not accept the argument that the route of the fence was determined by political rather than security needs. The justices specifically rejected the idea that the fence should be constructed on the Green Line or the border between the Israelis and the Palestinians, noting that it is a, the security perspective and not the political one which must examine a route based on security merits alone without regard for the location of the Green Line or border line between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The justice also concluded that it is permitted by international law to be applied in an area under belligerent occupation to take possession of an individual's land in order to erect a separation fence upon it on the condition that it is necessitated by military needs. To the extent 
that the construction of the fence is a military necessity, it is permitted by international law. Indeed, the obstacle is intended to take the place of combat or military operations by physically blocking terrorist infiltration into Israeli population centers. The fundamental question for the court was how to satisfy Israel's security concerns without causing disproportionate injury to the residents affected by the fence, that is, the Arabs. Where construction of the separation fence demands that the inhabitants be separated from their lands, access to these lands must be ensured in order to minimize their hardship. And as Richard Cohen wrote in the Washington Post, the length of the fence involved and the number of villages and people affected is hardly momentous. But as a statement of principle, it is head and shoulders above anything any other Middle East government would permit, never mind implement. Although the Israeli Supreme Court's decision made the government's job of securing the Israeli population from terrorism more difficult, costly, and time-consuming, the Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, immediately accepted the decision and began to reroute the section of the fence near Jerusalem, just about two kilometers from here. And in addition, the court's ruling is also being factored into the planning of the rest of the barrier. This is Dr. Jay Rawlings reporting to you for Fact or Fantasy from Jerusalem. Welcome again to His Still Small Voice, meeting me here in a beautiful garden in the hills of Benjamin just outside of the city of Jerusalem. My name is Maridel Rawlings and it is my joy to spend a few minutes with you this week. How do we pray? Oh, that's another hot word. We don't pray. Well, do we think? All the time. Can we turn off our thoughts? No. Maybe in an exhausted state as we fall into sleep, then blissful rest. Our brains are quiet, but actually they're very busy when we're sleeping. But when we're awake, Every single second of the day, our minds are working, perceiving, thinking, calculating, analyzing, observing, judging, discerning, responding, learning, and all the emotions that go with those kinds of movements in our incredible minds that we've been given. The greatest computer in the universe sits on top of your shoulders and it's been given to you. Isn't that marvelous? But I want to talk about something greater than your mind. We need to find something greater than our own worlds because if we're honest with ourselves, we often feel that we're caught. We're in a cage. We can't break out of ourselves. We can't get out of our little world. We want a large world. We want to feel that we can live and that life is full of possibilities. Well, I'm going to give you something that helped me. You can think and your creator will respond. You don't have to get down on your knees. You don't have to fold your hands. You don't even have to go into a so-called religious building. Wherever you are is good enough, in a subway, anywhere in your home, in a garden, in the street, in the car, in the traffic, when your kid is screaming her head off and you don't know what to do. You'd like to throw her against the wall. You've had enough. You're worn out. You're exhausted. You can just think. There are wonderful stories written in the Word of God that are put there as an encouragement because they're written about real people. Samuel was a little boy with a very special name, which means God hears. And he was given over to a priest, Eli. We won't tell the story, but I want you to remember one word, Hineni. At night he was awakened because he heard his name called, Samuel. And he ran to the priest and the priest said no. And three times he ran to the priest because three times he heard his name called in the night. And finally the priest said, Samuel, the Lord is calling you. And what did the response of that little child give back to this voice that called him? He me. That's all you have to say in your prayer. <laughs> he me. 
It would be wonderful if you heard God speak your voice. Believe me, you would feel his love. And it's just so precious to feel his love. I have had that privilege, and it's awesome, and it's humbling. Hineni is the word you want to say, which simply means, I'm here. Find me. I'm here. Maybe we can talk about that another time. Hineni. If you have more questions, you'd like to know something else, meet me at my website, hisstillsmallvoice.com. Thank you.